Hello, Paul Green here with another one of our regular Focus On panels. Uh, we do them every uh, Tuesday at 11 a.m. Sorry for starting a little bit late today. We had a few technical issues uh, kicking it all off, but we're here now. So the idea really is just to bring together a, a panel of people just to sort of discuss a particular topic, um, which hopefully will be fairly engaging. So if you're listening to this as a live stream and you want to bring up any questions or comments, then please do so as we go through this. Likewise, if you're listening on a replay, you can always put a comment in there and we'll come back to you later. So before we dive into our topic today, let's go around the room and introduce our panellists. So Rachel, Hi, so I'm Rachel Collar from the House of HR, providing uh, HR and recruitment solutions for um, small businesses across Northamptonshire and Milton Keynes. Thank you very much. And Chris? Hi everyone, Chris from DataSense. We are data protection specialists. We do this via managed IT, cybersecurity and GDPR policies and procedures. And Mark, who looks very comfy in his lounge. <laughs> Yeah, Mark, Mark Exe from Gravitas HR Solutions, providing HR services to local SME population. Excellent. OK, so I think this was your uh, suggested topic, Mark, if I, re I remember correctly. So I thought, yeah, why not? We'll go with that. So no pressure to perform, Mark. So uh, there's a lot going on in the world these days. So, um, uh, you know, cost of living, inflation, you name it, it's all sort of hitting us at the moment. So the topic today is how should employers respond to the cost of living crisis and it's particularly pertinent as i saw in the news today <clears throat> that as a result of uh, uh, inflation there's been a fall in the relative uh, uh, pay that people get so that obviously has an impact on people's pay packets so rachel will come to you first what, what how can employers respond what can they do Goodness. I mean, well, as we were, we were discussing before we came on live that, uh, you know, a lot of the, the big corporate world out there at the moment are kind of throwing money um, at it at the moment. Um, so kind of a, of a sticky plaster reaction. Um, but obviously, obviously, I'm also seeing that within um, SME clients as well. that They're looking at how can we kind of deal with an immediate fix or try to help in terms of the, the cost of living um, rises that we're seeing. So we've got clients that are looking at things about either giving gift vouchers to help out, um, kind of supermarket vouchers, those sorts of things to help with food bills. Um, also uh, awards for a cost of living increase. So it could be a one-off payment. I've seen typically between kind of uh, a thousand, to about two and a half thousand paid as a one-off payment. There's lots of implications for that for people, particularly if they're on, on benefits, but also seeing some clients spread that kind of um, bonus payment over kind of a six or 12 month period. So people are getting kind of a little bit more income um, on a more regular monthly basis. So that's kind of the biggies I'm seeing from a financial perspective as well. But I won't go into all the other stuff that, that there is, is available because I'm sure Mark and Chris will touch on that as well. But definitely seeing lots of people asking, how much should I award? What are other people doing? How can I be competitive um, in trying to sort out, you know, giving an instant increase? Because like you say, we've seen that, that wages with the, the rise of inflation, that wages are actually falling in real time by a kind of 3%. So effectively, people are kind of 3% worse off. Um, and at the moment, they're saying that that's the worst since the, the records began. But I think they only start recording that data in about the early 2000s. But um, it's interesting that we're, we're hitting that point because um, our only real reference point in that is probably the financial crisis back in 2008. Thank you, Rachel. Mark, do you want to build on that? What's what, what's your what's your thoughts? Yeah, I think I think the, the salient point is that, you know, inflation has exceeded pay increases, even though pay increases have hit about just under 5% in the first three months of this financial year. That's that's where the problem is. However, I think there, there, are, there are some other issues to play. I mean, many people who work in offices are now working from home, so they've cut the costs considerably as well. So it's not all a, a doom and gloom scenario. I think that the key for a lot of companies is to engage with the staff and make the staff want to work for them rather than throwing money at them um because throwing money at them is a, a one-off thing and you probably find that some of the people don't actually need that money and just go buy something with it it's all very nice but once it's gone it's gone um whereas obviously engaging with employees will give you a more engaged and committed workforce and people will not want to leave the majority of people don't necessarily look for change 
they want to stay where they are if possible and it's only going to be a, a real knee-jerk reaction to leave and i think the other factor is with the potential uh, with all the messaging in the media being about recession people are also going to be more reluctant to leave because they lose their security when they leave and move to somewhere new so it really depends on individuals and it, it has been very much a seller's market the recruitment um, market so people have been able to hold their companies to ransom in some cases we, we've got examples of people demanding pay increases or they'll leave yeah and they've had the bluff called so they've yeah. had the notice in and then when that notice has been accepted they've had a meltdown and said oh i didn't really want to leave and all that sort of stuff so people need to be a little bit careful about how they manage it as individuals but also companies need to be mindful that this is a real issue and what's coming down the track could potentially be worse if you if if the energy price continues to rise domestic energy that is yeah 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 so so chris you're not Per, per se in the HR world, I just wonder what your view is on it and whether you've seen any <clears throat> any of your customers uh, taking action as a result of uh, uh, increased cost of living. Um, well, again, I don't really get involved in companies' uh, HR stuff either, so I don't necessarily see what they're doing for their employees. Um, but to play devil's advocate with it, I, I think a lot of what Mark said is not always about the money for the staff. And I think it's you, Paul, you've mentioned where you've or another business coach, and I can't think of it would be if it's not yourself, um, it was in a company where they spoke to the employees to find out what the employees wanted. And it wasn't always cash because, as Mark said, people don't necessarily need the money. They might, you know, the mortgage might be paid off. They don't need the extra bit of money each month. But actually, adjustments to working hours or just an additional day's holiday might be all they want for the satisfaction of the company. But the flip side of it all for small businesses is going to be, and Mark touched on this, the, the energy prices, it's going to start crippling small businesses. We're looking at it uh, within the Nova Centre here that our energy prices are about to shoot up because we've just come out of contract. The so small mm. businesses are going to struggle to find the money to pay the staff the extra money they need to survive. Mm. I mean, with, with your FSB hat on and putting you on the spot a little bit, um, uh, is the FSB doing sort of anything actively with their connections through government to sort of help with the, the fuel and uh, utility crisis? Uh, that I, even with my FSB hat on, I don't know. That would be a question for Jen or one of the, the higher ups. Uh, yeah. I just help co run the breakfast. But um, knowing how the FSB is, they, they survey their members regularly. They will be engaging with. Um, from a, this will be a, from a business point of view. They will be engaging with government if we actually have one at the moment, um, given what's going on, um, as to what they, what can be done. And to be honest, I think that the short answer is we should all be lobbying MPs as business owners or employees to say sort out the energy cap. You know, the EU have already done that. Our energy cap is about 200 times or 200 percent higher than what many countries in the EU have put in. So if you want real power from the people, start lobbying your MP. Okay, here's an interesting one. Uh, uh, St Steve joined us last time, so thanks for coming back again, uh, Steve. We're obviously doing something right to uh, keep entertained. So, his, so yeah, so Steve's question is, uh, why should employers respond to the cost of living crisis? Uh, my cost of living is, is my issue, not my employers. Who wants to have a stab at that one, then? I'll take that one. <laughs> <laughs> We're not talking about whose issue it actually is, but ultimately, if the employee then leaves and they're a valuable employee, then it is the issue of the company. Yeah. Is, is the easy answer to that. But I, I take the point. Um, you know, a happy, engaged workforce that feels you know, valued and trusted is going to be the bedrock of your business. And it, it, you have to be mindful of what's going on in the in, in the outside world. You cannot just look at your internal um, situation. So there's got to be a little bit of uh, got a little little bit of leeway there. But I do, I do believe the knee jerk reaction is probably not the right one. I think there's, it needs to be thought through, and it needs to be a balance of measures, not just one thing. Mm -hmm. So Rachel, back back to you. What 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 are some of the other things? Because I guess you know the, these these employers don't have deep pockets, and costs are rising for them 
uh, as well, I guess, depending on which industry sector. And so, so what, what else do you think that employers can do to uh, help with this situation? Well, yeah, just we're just touching back on the, the last point as well. You know, there is you know, we've talked you know, here. It's, it's very individual, this situation for a lot of people. And, you know, there are those that have got mortgages paid off. There's those that can't even afford to, to feed their family. So some real extremes of, of people's personal situations. And for me, there is that moral case for supporting the financial well-being um, as well as kind of the business case. And we all know that if you well, there's lots of research out there that shows when you're worried about money, work does suffer and we see that through either increased absence or reduced productivity um, so the financial wellness um, support often it can be just directing people to where to find resources there are so many support organizations out there that can help individuals on a confidential free one-to-one -one basis one of the big ones I always promote is Citizen Vice Bureau, particularly if your organisation hasn't got an employee assistance programme or what you might hear is called as an EAP that often help with financial and debt management. Um, if you don't have one of those in place, then there is the Citizen Vice Bureau. Um, the, and, but loads of free resources out there um, that are available online that you can just direct people to. But also it's about having managers who are approachable, who are empathetic, that can listen to kind of employees worries and concerns and maybe point them and signpost and this is not about having all the solutions for people but providing the education and most importantly signposting them um, and if in particularly the employees don't really know where to start that's where the likes of people like me and Mark can help with that journey and, and where they can go to for some of that support. Yeah, so, so, so building on that, Russell's in the background, in the studio, as it were, here. So thanks for joining us, Russell. Should the employer have a duty of care to help support employees, not necessarily financially, but help employees get support? Mark, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think Rachel just touched on EAP schemes, so employee assistance programmes. Um, a good employer will want to look after their employees and part of that is to provide support and guidance even through third party to help them to navigate through some of these issues and and therefore get a very good committed um, employee out of it so the EAC it's a two-way street one it's the right thing to do from an ethical point of view and two it actually has a financial benefit to companies um, but for the individual um, being looked after and, and be helped a little bit will go a long way to um, to helping them. And as I think the financial well-being always trips over or if someone's got an issue with their financial well-being, it's going to trip over into their physical well-being or mental well-being as well. Um, and that's not going to be good for anybody. It's a it's a lose lose situation. So anything mm. companies can do to support employees through advice lines, you know, counselling, that kind of thing, if necessary is really valuable and will have a benefit to all parties. Do, do, in, do, do you think that smaller businesses, I don't know, for our, our, you know, arbitrary sort of pick companies or any point like five staff, uh, is it going to be more difficult for them if they've got less employees or is it is it sort of like across the board thing? If you've only got five employees, you probably could do something on a more bespoke basis if you needed to. Um, even do it in, themselves in terms of helping people and uh, to understand the situation uh, and looking after the well-being. It doesn't matter how big the company is. There's lots of stuff you can do around well-being of all all kinds. Um, it doesn't. It's not really an excuse not to do it. But because your familiarity with those people is is an affiliation is probably greater than a company say with 200 people, then you can take a more individual approach to it. Mm -hmm. Chris, one for you. Let's see how you get on with this one. Do, do you think that employees um, that might be struggling uh, more because of their their, their um, uh, bills they've got to pay, do you think that, that, that some of them will be taking part-time jobs and doing other stuff? What's your view on that? Uh, well, having actually had to deal with this for a client a couple of years back, uh, actually during the first part of the pandemic, um, they had a member of staff who had been with the company some time I don't know all the ins and outs of it, uh, but was struggling financially, we believe, because of the, because of his partner pushing for more and more expensive things. He actually ended up stealing from the company to the tune of, we believe, 20,000 plus across about an eight-month period. And it only came up because an audit was coming up, but he uh, confessed to it and then 
Toby's notice in this now a police matter and being discussed. But yes, I think uh, people will find other ways. It may be taken on a second job, which hopefully, well, not hopefully, because that's the wrong thing to say, but it's the more legitimate option is yes, if you, know, if you can find a side hustle, take on a part time job, then yes, it's a better option than embezzlement. But um, I think we'll, across the board, we'll see people trying to find ways to survive. It, it's coming down to, you know, heat your house or be hard to eat. Um, people won't people won't put up for too long with that with only those two options they'll find a way just just so we're clear we're not endorsing stealing or embezzlement in any way shape or form um so so rachel if people um if employees now if we look at them from their perspective if if they are looking to supplement their income is is that is that something that's easy for them to do a lot of organizations allow that and what, what do you think the consequences will be from that employee's well-being if they're trying to yeah. manage two jobs always look at your contract so um, typically you'll find a clause in your contract if you are going to want to take on a second job usually you'll need to get authorization probably from hr or the md or director um to do that particularly when it might, might be potentially conflict of interest um i would say from my experience nine times about 10 there hasn't been and the organisations kind of agreed to it and you kind of look okay what else are they doing what else are they doing in their new role and again come back to that duty of care issue you know they're going to end up working you know I've known people that kind of would finish a Monday Friday night to a five job and then would start their evening job and work kind of the small hours because they're almost really not having any downtime uh, looking after their own physical mental well-being with the hours that they do but you know it's those things that typically yeah, you definitely look at contracts, definitely speak to your manager about um, that and what hours you might be doing, how that might impact when they're then back at working with you, you find they're sleeping on their job or anything like that, or you see increased stress levels, you know, they're definitely some telltale signs if somebody's actually doing too much, so that's just something to be mindful of. You went a bit crackly, but I think we got the gist mm -hmm. of that. Uh, Mar Martin's uh, just asked a question. Um, do you think this will see more people working back in the office again to save their own utility bills? Mark, what are your thoughts on that? Well, um, we, within within our little company, we've had this discussion um, because we know a lot of people who've been working, loving the fact they're working from home when the weather's fantastic and not really thinking too much about utility bills. But if mm. there is the um, proposed increase in the cap, in October, that is going to really impact on a lot of people and having the heating on all day because you're working from home will have an impact. There will be people wanting to go back. We're still seeing a complete mixture of people on this subject anyway. Part of the reason people go to work is for social interaction um, and you don't get any social interaction or not really proper social interaction when you're sitting at home. So I, th I think there are a lot of people who like going into offices still but maybe enjoy the freedom for it to be a blended approach of say three days in and three days at home. But I do, I, I, I think that is a good point. And I think we feel that a lot of people will suddenly realize that it costs quite a bit in winter to work from home. On the other hand, it depends how far the commute is. <laughs> they're going to do that. They're probably going to do a calculation, say how much is it costing me to drive to work versus how much is it costing to keep the heating on? Yeah, it's a bit of a problem, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Mean, bit of a double debate, whammy, isn't it? So I've definitely seen sort of clients interesting now kind of reverting and going and moving away from hybrid and actually wanting people back in, not from cost of living perspective, but definitely that social interaction element or knowing what's going on around the business, the camaraderie, all of those those things you have, the water cooler moments. So definitely seeing the smaller businesses really trying to get people back in the office. And this might be something that actually encourages people to she wants to be back if they have that long commute and those high petrol costs to think about that as well yeah there's a bit of a double whammy mm. so um mark in, in your experience in some of the people that you're working with are, are they taking action right now because they because they need to and, uh, and employees are putting the pressure on or, or are people not specifically doing anything right now i think it's a complete mixed bag um what, what we've seen over the let's talk about this financial year because that's where we got some stats that we talked about earlier was from the financial year um recruitment has been really difficult and what we found is that some clients are parking their recruitment and actually focusing a little bit more on looking after their existing employees um so that is actually damaging effectively 
the recruitment side of it. But because recruitment is so tight anyway at the moment and attracting people is so difficult, um, I, I, th I think it's a bit of a double whammy on that. So, yeah, companies are, are thinking ahead a little bit about whether it costs are going to increase and also the fact that it's going to cost them a lot if they lose some of their best people. So, yeah, mm -hmm. people are starting to think along those lines. But say it's not all cash. It's it's about, you, you know, it's about engaging with people and seeing and really thinking again on your proposition as an employer as to what you can add that is maybe a lower cost but valuable um, benefit to people. Mm -hmm. That's where the, that's that's the, the, the upshot is that there is no magic bullet it's a combination of factors and every company will be in a different position an example i've got is that particularly in the sales sphere a lot of very high salaries have been paid to recruit salespeople uh, in the last three months and without a doubt if we do get into recession there's going to be some business owners and directors scratching their heads and wondering why they actually did that because they're going to have you know for example they may have a a salesperson who should be earning 40,000, earning 60,000, and then they realize they're not actually that good. It's a very difficult situation because once you, once the genie is out of the bottle, it's very difficult to get it back in there. And I think, you know, once you do start to raise um, salaries and wages, you can't take it away again. You have yeah. to find other ways to save costs, which can be more destructive than that. Yeah, cause, yeah, I was thinking that myself, you know, whether there's a light at the end of the tunnel and what will happen when things do get a little bit more balanced, I guess. They've set that precedence. They've, you know, thrown money at it. And now they're in that situation where, you know, their costs have increased and the expectation is there going forward, I guess, isn't it? So what are your thoughts on that, Rachel? Let's see if your microphone's a bit better. Yeah, hopefully you can hear me now. Um, so definitely I've seen, you know, even from where they are needing to recruit, um, is actually taking people um, that are probably quite more junior, so that that lower salary um, hit, but, but actually um, investing in the development of that person over the longer term, so they aren't having to pay some of those higher inflated salaries. So definitely, I'm also seeing with clients um, really that that development of their people, or you know the whole thing Mark talks about that retention and how you can engage and keep people. So it's definitely taking that long-term support view of how can you actually develop that person in the longer term to get where we need them to be, particularly when we've got the recruitment challenges as well that Mark alludes to? Yeah, I think we've just about got that. Chris, so as a potential, I don't, I don't think you employ anybody in your business at, at the moment, um, no, whether there are plans to do it. Do, does this potentially put a small business owner like yourself off considering recruiting uh, staff because of the, the implications it may have? Well, we at the moment we don't have any plans to take on any, anyone else at the moment we are happy where we are um but again i think it will um as business costs rise they've got to still find salary for an additional person if it's even if it's through the business they still really want to get the person bedded in and a, a different business coach i, I know years back said if you can find 50 percent of someone's salary they'll find the other 50 percent um but i think if you're going to struggle finding that because business costs are getting tighter, then it's going to put, it will put the small business off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. So um, any other views, Mark, anything else you want to add on this, this topic that we haven't yet covered? Well, I think, I think looking, looking a bit wider, we've come through a period of two years where many people have managed to accrue quite a lot of disposable income. Whether they've used that wisely or not is another matter, but some will have done and some people will have taken the opportunity to do some work on the house or change the car or whatever else it is that they want to do. Um, I think people have sort of got out of, people got out of the habit ne of necessarily spending as much and then all of a sudden being given the opportunity to go back on holiday and all this sort of stuff. So I think this coming on the back of that kind of disruptive period of time has made it worse really because pr i think prior to prior to the covid uh, period things were good the economy was pretty strong 
employment was good people were going about the business and i think everyone was reasonably happy i think since then obviously it's thrown a lot of people's minds in a different direction mm -hmm. and this coming on the back of it is a bit of a kick in the teeth for a lot of people i think on a, another wider point is on education because we've mentioned education and people needing to be a little bit better and smarter around how they use the money um and it does bring home to roost all those missed opportunities through schools of actually educating people in managing finances mm. you know this is this is where we have this very laissez-faire attitude in the uk and let people just get on with it the reality is you've got a perfect opportunity to have a course a curriculum subject about managing finance so that young people actually reach an adulthood have actually got some understanding of managing money they don't mm. take any notice of it of course but we don't seem to do anything on those lines it's all very abstract um the learning that we give um young people in schools just an idea but i think that's something that ought to be considered because we've gone through the credit crunch which was largely down to people over borrowing and borrowing when you can't afford to pay it back and now we're heading down a similar route where people have their gearing is all wrong they're spending far too much money because they don't seem to understand money it just slips through the fingers or they think oh it's all right i'll do it on credit mm. that's what's coming home to roost now as inflation rises it's the debt that is crippling people not necessarily the fact that fuel's gone up it's, it's the gearing they've already got and that's where the education piece needs to come in yeah we, we, we've touched on that on one of these before about the the education of people at a younger age about the money and what it means and i know there are some organizations out there that do in fact go into schools and <clears throat> provide that that sort of service but you're right it's, it's not a curriculum curriculum that curriculum that's not easy to say curriculum thing um it's just done really you know just just based on whether the school were prepared to bring an external agency and sort of talk about that Ra rachel any, any final things th things from you no, I think well, I definitely concur with Mark regarding that that financial education. I think mine was getting my my first job at fifteen, and then working for a bank, and that's where I got my real grounding, learning about interest rates, credit cards, loans, all of that lovely stuff as well. So without that, I don't know how I would have kind of grown grown that knowledge. But definitely, you know, it's about how you can support employees through that kind of financial well-being whether that's education access to it signposting it can seem a bit like a you know it's so difficult to kind of where to start what do i do but there's lots of support out there whether that's free or actually there's a lot of providers out there that are really trying to support sme markets mona and making some of their stuff you know what i would call affordable you know we're looking at maybe several pounds a year per employee to offer some of the the resources out there in terms of employee assistance or financial well-being platforms as well but definitely look at i say if you haven't have a review overhaul, look at the benefit packages you've got in place at the moment. Are they working hard? Are you getting the best return for both the business and for employees? And I think what everyone has said here as well is talk to your people, understand what support they would find useful and helpful as well. It's all good for us to sit here and come up with ideas, but ultimately asking your teams and um, their feedback is absolutely critical. Yeah, and I guess it's not a one size fits all. There's no solution, no off the shelf solution for every business. Yeah. I guess you've just got to, as you said, engage your employees and find out what what they want and how you can best support yeah. them. Any any final point from you, Mr. Lambert? No, I think Rachel and Mark have really summed it up really well. I do agree that education wise, schools lack um, any training for money management, and that's been for as long as I can remember. So that that would go a long, long way, and I think actually that would serve industry a lot better going forward as well because you'd have business owners coming in that actually understood money so a number of times we've seen businesses just set up not understand the figures and then months later they're shutting down owing in some cases tens of thousands of pounds mm. so i think mark's, mark's point of education in schools for financial management goes a long long way to help a lot of things 
there you go. You heard it first here. Well, probably not. I'm just trying to take the glory. So thanks for <laughs> panellists today uh, for coming up and talking. It's going to be an increasingly important topic going forward, I think, for any uh, employer. Uh, next week, uh, again, 11 a.m. Tuesday, we're going to be looking <clears throat> at more of the strategy and personal development side of business. So look out for that. Uh, we'll call it a day there. Thanks again, guys, for joining me. And thanks for those tuning in live and anybody that's listening to the replay.